I'd like to welcome everyone. And the first thing I want to do is to uh, thank the Storers and the Storer Endowment for making today's lecture uh, on the future of coral reefs and tomorrow's lecture on the connectivity, ecosystem overfishing, and rebuilding of coral reef fisheries uh, possible. Uh, 410, so if you like what you hear today, tomorrow will be uh, a bit more technical, but a lot of the same. And uh, we're thrilled to have uh, Peter Mumby visiting us from the University of Queensland in Australia. Peter got his uh, bachelor's degree from Liverpool in 1992, a PhD uh, looking at uh, coral reefs and remote sensing from the University of Sheffield in 1997. Uh, he then had a uh, NERC postdoctoral research fellowship and then a Royal Society research fellowship uh, where he was then at the University of Exeter. And since 2010, he's been the, an ARC laureate professorial fellow at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia. He's won numerous awards. He's one of the, the leaders in uh, the study of coral reefs and thinking as well very much about the interface between the science of understanding what's going on with coral reefs and potential policy aspects ranging from uh, more local things like the study of marine protected areas to more global issues thinking about uh, things like global change and how they might impact coral reefs. So please uh, welcome Peter. Well. Thank you very much, Alan. It's a real privilege and pleasure to be here. And I'd also like to echo the thanks to the Stora family for making this possible. Um, I've been coming to Davis on and off for a number of years. I think the first time was maybe 13 years ago. And I always love coming here, um, especially because you have fabulous access to uh, the arts, especially Mandavi Center and the jazz there. When I took the decision to move to Australia, um, one of the big costs of leaving the UK was my access to, to jazz was really curtailed in Australia, unfortunately. And so now I take any opportunity to come to California. Um, sometimes I, I go on a jazz cruise that leaves out of Florida. I don't even get off the ship. I just spend the week working, writing papers, and in the evenings enjoying the music. So it's always a great pleasure to be here. So I have, so anyway, um, I had a lovely few days talking to people with, about ideas and, and sharing ideas with, with folk. And what I'd like to do this afternoon is, is focus a bit on, on coral reefs and take us away from this weather that's, of course, incredibly familiar to me. It reminds me of my upbringing in England. And, um, and let's, let's go and look at something a bit uh, warmer for a while and, and focus on these questions of what's happening in this ecosystem. And I picked coral bleaching because it's something that's been very widely reported in the news over the last year or two, and it's something that... A lot of people ask questions. Every time I see people and they, you mention the Great Barrier Reef, they'll ask, isn't it dead? So let's, let's see if that's really the case. Now, just to sort of set us up, that opening image is, is a shot from the Maldives in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And um, these are some photographs I took in the Maldives in 2016 as uh, one of this, these global bleaching events was beginning to unfold. So in this time, the reefs look absolutely beautiful. You can see these white corals. They're often fluorescing brightly. Um, uh, the tourists there were remarking how beautiful and healthy the reefs look, and they were certainly half right. They were certainly beautiful. Um, you've got these lovely white colors, and um, you know it's spectacular. Um, in December, I went back, and it was a very different story, of course, and what was you know, a fantastic experience turned into a sort of very green, brown, monotonous thing. There was about 98% coral mortality. And uh, this happened over the period of about three months. And so when you look at these reefs now, you're really struggling to find things that look, you know, make a good composition even. I really failed. And, you know, the fish are still there. Some of them have gone. But you see the structure. These, these corals are now dead. They're still providing habitat for the time being but they won't do for an awful lot longer. Um, lots of dead corals that are beginning to fall over. And it was really remarkable to me how rapidly that structure starts to break down. Um, so this is the, 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 the type of, of environment you look at. 
and you end up sort of having to resort to taking photographs of turtles to make it look a bit more interesting, um, you know, and, and, and so on. So there's still pretty fish to look at. The tourists are generally pretty happy, but this is not a good ecological story at this stage. So what happened? What is coral bleaching? Um, and, you know, coral bleaching is, is one of the most, I guess, startling symptoms of climate change and stress in any ecosystem. Uh, and this is just another example. Going across the reef, this is Fiji. Um, they had a big bleaching event began in 2015. It's happened a year earlier here. And this event extended to Hawaii. Hawaii has had these sorts of conditions for about three years in places. And so as you swim across it, you know, it really is visually impressive. Um, I haven't had the courage to go back to this site yet. I don't think I can quite cope with the depression of seeing what likely happened. Um, but that's what we're looking at. And one of the reasons that corals have been so successful, and corals, as I'm sure most of you know, of course, are like a colonial sea anemone almost. And one of the reasons they're so successful is that they're feeding all of the time. At night, they extend their tentacles and they're catching plankton and feeding from the plankton. But during the day, their body is absolutely loaded with the symbiotic algae. And there's about a million of them in an area of coral the size of your fingernail. So these are very high densities, and it's these algae that give the coral its color. And the coral, whilst these things are photosynthesizing during the day like any plant, the energy that's derived from that is powering the calcification, the production of this limestone skeleton that protects the coral. And it essentially lays down another layer every year. So um, what happens during coral bleaching? Well, it was actually a colleague of mine, Roberto Iglesias, who was in Mexico, who spent his whole life studying the photobiology of, of marine organisms. And he had an epiph epiphany one day. So he's sitting in his office, and because he's a coral guy, his office is full of coral skeletons. And his daughter came running in, holding one of those little laser pointers, and was, was trying to sort of zoom him in the eye. And so he scolded her, confiscated the laser pointer, sat back in his chair, and pointed it at the corals on the, on the side. And he just pointed this laser, and the laser diameter is about five millimeters. When you point it at a coral skeleton, it's about anything up to two inches, a glowing red area of about two inch diameter. And he said, huh, corals are one of the best scatterers of light in nature. And this is one of their successes because that means they're extremely good at capturing and harnessing light very efficiently, but it's also their Achilles heel. And so if we go back to this sort of uh, schematic of a coral, what happens under normal circumstances is that the sunlight will pass through the coral. Some of that is absorbed by the zooxanthellae and used for energy creation. Um, and some of it reflects off of the skeleton back through the coral and has another opportunity to be harvested. It then passes through, some of it gets scattered again, and you can imagine that this light is scattered multiple times. Now, under normal circumstances, um, by about midday, the photosystem, the machinery inside the alga, is very heavily stimulated by sunlight, and essentially it can overwhelm the system. There's more light than it needs to produce sugars and so forth. So that excess energy is absorbed by all sorts of mechanisms that the algae have at their disposal. It's not a problem. It's a source of stress, but it's manageable. When you have exceptionally warm conditions, and this can only be maybe one degree warmer than usual in summer, then the level of light that becomes overwhelming becomes lower. So you might imagine that under normal conditions, by midday, the coral's saying, okay, it's saturated with light. Under warm conditions, by 9 o'clock in the morning, it's already got enough light, thank you. And by midday, it's really stressed. That results in um, harmful oxygen-free radicals, and those can kill these cells. And so the coral either expels these cells, or they just break down. And of course, once that happens, the coral starts to become paler. It's losing its pigmentation. And as it becomes paler, the light passes through the coral even more times which means it ramps up the pressure on the cells that are still there. And that's why you get this reinforcing feedback. And as soon as it becomes stressful, the conditions get worse and worse and worse for the coral very rapidly. And within a few days, a coral reef can go from a beautiful sort of bunch of browns and reds to white. 
So it's a very quick process. And if that persists for a few months, this can result in the, in the corals dying. But it doesn't always happen this way. Um, and I, I, I do apologize for sounding a bit like one of those people that says, <laughs> when I was in Tahiti, or when I was in the Maldives. <laughs> but when I was in Tahiti, um, uh, so in 1998, they had this big ENSO event, and there was a big bleaching event in, uh, in this is Morea next to Tahiti. And the odd thing was, if you look at the sea temperature records, for 1998, the anomalies of sea temperature were just like the previous years when these reefs had bleached. There's research stations there, so people know exactly what had happened in the past. But it didn't bleach in 98. And I went to the airport, which records the amount of, of uh, cloud cover three times a day. They're required to do that. And it turns out this was the cloudiest summer on record. So in this case, because the clouds reduce the amount of light, the reefs escaped bleaching. So we, you know, we have various lines of evidence, even at large scales, that the combination of sunlight and temperature is what's responsible for bleaching. And these big events, like those that have hit Australia, the Maldives, and everywhere else, primarily because the water's unusually warm. So a thing that really hit the headlines over the last couple of years is Australia. This is the Barrier Reef, so just to give you the usual context, Australians love to boast about how big the reef is. It's about the size of Italy. And um, in 2016, this is a map of sort of anomalously warm temperature. The reds are where you've got very warm water in summer. And we've got this very hot period up in the north of Australia. So Papua New Guinea is just up here. It had never happened like this before. In the past, it had happened. This is 1998. There was a lot of bleaching down here. This was another event, 2002. But this was um, unprecedented for Australia. It's not unprecedented globally, but for Australia it was. So this has obviously raised a lot of concerns about the future of reefs in Australia. And so we and others have, have, have done a variety of approaches to try and project well, what's likely to happen. And, um, and these models, I must say, are, tend to err on the pessimistic because they tend to assume very limited scope for adaptation to warmer in conditions, which is pretty much almost certainly wrong. So these are pessimistic. And so what we do is we would sort of project, this is a sort of an average um, representation of what we expect to see. So you might say, if you plot the amount of living coral, which is the most commonly used metric, the percentage of live stuff, over time, um, this is a kind of business as usual. So we, this is actually slightly worse. We're doing, we're degrading the environment even further with some of the policies that are currently being considered. At the same time, we're following the business as usual greenhouse gas emission pathway. Slightly worse than this now. And this is, if you have all stresses combined, it's not a very happy story. Historically, the cover of this reef should be at least 30%. If you were to uh, deal with some of the water quality problems stemming from the agriculture on land, you could improve that outlook fairly well. If you could deal with the crown of thorns starfish, which are these marauding starfish that uh, have population explosions about once every 15 years, and they last for maybe four or five years. And there's believed to be a link with water quality with these crown of thorn starfish outbreaks. And these starfish, I don't know how many of you have ever seen them. I mean, they're really quite beautiful, but they're horrendous. I mean, they can get about this size. A friend of mine got pricked by one of these thorns. He was trying to kill it. It had the last laugh. And it pricked him just under his fingernail, and he lost feeling in his finger for six months. These are really unpleasant creatures. And a single female can release 11 million eggs a month. So they're also incredibly fecund. Um, so if you can deal with this, and the way that people deal with it is they send an army of boats out, well, three, and each boat has 10 divers, and their job is nothing but to go down there with a, with a, a stick, uh, not stick, a, a, an injection, and inject them with vinegar. A single shot is enough to kill a starfish. So if you could keep, do that, you would improve your trajectory, and if you didn't have to worry about climate change, well, we wouldn't be worried about anything. Um, um, and we can sort of run different scenarios. We can say, well, you know, what if we were to slightly improve the local management? You can get some, some benefits from that. But as you start looking towards the more optimistic uh, greenhouse gas emission scenarios, you can see that the size of the climate change impact is starting to diminish. Um, and then this is 2.6. This is the, 
sort of most optimistic trajectory that people are considering right now that requires us to actively sequester carbon. Um, you know, and this is if we, we do that with a few other tweaks. Um, and under these conditions, you can actually have a reef that doesn't look at all bad towards the end of the, the um, period. And interestingly, these are essentially just contrasting um, the climate change uh, scenarios. And what you can see is that if you can manage the climate change system, the scope to improve the outcomes through local management is much greater. This makes sense. So there's a real value in local interventions, especially if we can get a handle on the climate problem. All right. So we know that doing things locally is imperative as well as doing things globally. So what do we do? Um, you know, there's a lot of effort and it's been going on for a long time of trying to change agricultural practice and increasingly move to good practice, maintaining riparian corridors, um, things like that. One of the major problems, however, is that we've had nearly 200 years of European settlement, just clearing much of that forest. And during that period, there's a huge amount of sediment that's just flowed down the rivers and just accrued outside the estuaries. And every time you have a major storm, it picks up that sediment, resuspends it, generates a huge pulse of nutrients that gets washed out to the reef. There's no easy solution to that. And what we do in the catchments isn't going to change that problem. So there's still some really huge issues to deal with on the water quality side. The next thing we can do is try to manage the habitat quality. This is so that when you do have corals trying to regrow on the reef after they've been hit by a bleaching event, you're improving the chances that they'll be able to recruit. And I'm just going to take a little um, sideline to explore that in a little bit more detail. And this is something we've been looking at. I do sound like one of those people when I'm in Palau. Um, but this is, Palau is a really interesting location to do this because you have a huge diversity of environments within 20 minutes of a research station. So you can go to really polluted areas and really quite pristine environments as well. And so we, we we essentially build our work around these coral settlement tiles. And so this is simply a limestone tile. It sort of mimics a piece of coral reef with crevices on it that represent the, the types of crevice sizes that corals like to settle in. And you can do a bunch of experiments on this. You can ask questions about, let's take a reductionist approach and break down the process of corals entering the population and recruiting to that population. So you have this larval coral it has to find a place to settle, grow, and establish itself. And so there's issues of substrate colonization. The settlement, there's behavior that the corals are quite fussy about where they're going to settle, and, and there's cues that the algae themselves cue in where the corals are going to settle. Then they have to grow. We can um, look at the different sort of substrate transitions and model how these ecosystems begin to develop in these environments. We can think about the importance of competition, of herbivory that keeps the seaweeds under control, and corollivory, the predation by, by fish. And some of these fish are incredible predators of corals. You know, when you set out video cameras and you see them coming out, we had these little corals of different sizes, and they're really very selective. You know, they sort of come along and take a good look, and oh, I think I'll have that one. And they're very specific, and they just take that one, and they look, and they take another one. Um, and you, you know, you watch some of these videos, and you. You can't help but anthropomorphize sometimes and sort of think what these fish are doing. Anyway, we undertake a variety of experiments, and then we have to ask ourselves, you know, we're trying to break apart the processes of recruitment, but when we put the system back together again and then confront ourselves with the question, do we, do we really understand this now? Is our new understanding actually correct, or as correct as we can be? Did we miss a key process? Maybe we've done all these experiments and we've put everything back together, but it doesn't work. Or perhaps the processes that we've been measuring, herbivory, coral livery, the selection, the behavior of the coral larvae, integrate in a way that we, we, we're not quite appreciating. And so we, we, that's one of the great values of putting these things into models, is to test whether or not our insight seems to be on track. And well, it appeared to be, so we're quite happy with that. And we can sort of break this down. I know this is a complex diagram, so I'll just keep it simple. This is a sort of summary of this. So imagine that you have a 1,000 coral larvae entering the system, and, and they have to settle. They have to survive the first few months, and eventually they'll recruit into the population at about one year. And we can break down 
where do you get the greatest success? What pathway? Where would they settle under? What conditions to give them the best outcome? And this is the best outcome. You have an unfished system with a crevice. You have some predation, but not very high predation. And you have modest, but you have competition is present. And under those conditions, you get the best uh, recruitment. So in putting this in context, if you look at different microhabitats in the same system, you would have about a threefold uh, reduction in recruitment if you move to a, a surface where it's more exposed to predators. But if you fish that system, such as there's relatively few herbivorous fish, you would lose something like four to tenfold the amount of recruitment. So this is a very reductionist perspective. But it tells us that you know, these fish that we see are doing something to maintain the system's recovery. And we can look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, and so back to Morea. And Morea is a system that has um, been studied by French scientists for a long period of time. They really can demonstrate it's resilient. It bounces back every time, it seems. And so we did what ecologists love to do and put out cages and, and, and manipulated the access of, of larger fish to the reef substrate. The fantastic innovation here was this sort of uh, coral settlement tiles surrounded by this crown of stainless steel thorns, if you like. And if a big fish tried to get in there and feed, it would often get poked in the eye. Did, no fish were actually harmed in this experiment. But, you know, but they were, you know, this prevents bigger fish accessing. So it simulates overfishing in contrast to putting a cage there where you pretty much get rid of almost all of the fish, which is not very realistic in many situations, other than places like the Philippines where that's what happens. And when we do this, we you know, look at these tiles, we look at the amount of coral recruitment after a year. And to summarize what we found, if you have um, an area which is our control where the fish can feed freely, um, we have our second treatment that we're interested in where you've just removed the larger fish. And then when we do, do something very extreme. And the response of the seaweeds, this particular seaweed is called Lobophora, is quite striking. Well, let me rephrase that. It's usually almost absent in a control situation. You'll find tiny little pockets of it, but it's less than 1%. It reaches 5% when you get rid of the bigger fish and up to 25% when you just exclude the fish almost entirely. Um, when we look at the effect of this on the settlement of corals, um, normally under good conditions, you'd have pretty good settlement, a seven-fold reduction, and then a 15-fold reduction. So this small increase in this seaweed, apparently small, still stimulates a massive reduction in the amount of settlement. It's as if the corals can smell it and decide we're not going to settle here. And then if you translate this Unfortunately, to the, to the uh, juvenile corals, well, it's a very different story. The juvenile corals um, do really well if you exclude most of the fish. And the reason for this is that they're vulnerable to predators at that size. And so when you protect them in a cage, they're no longer really vulnerable to the algae, but they really benefit from the lack of predation. So there's kind of benefits and costs of removing fish for corals. The benefit is that it's much more likely they'll settle because there's less seaweed. The cost is that those that do manage to settle will survive and grow better because they're um, not being preyed upon so frequently if you've got rid of the fish. So when you combine all of this again in a model and you look at the sort of recovery trajectories, overall, if you have the fish in the system, you get a better recovery trajectory than if you heavily extirpated those fish. So again, this is a sort of tortuous way of coming to the conclusion that fish have a net benefit on reefs, and why wouldn't they? Um, so again, this is evidence then that trying to control the herbivory is a good thing. Interestingly, when we repeat that experiment in Belize in the Caribbean, we get qualitatively similar results in terms of as you restrict the herbivores, seaweed increases, you get less coral recruitment. But the actual form of the relationship is wildly different. We weren't expecting this, but what we have here, this is the number of corals on the underside of a plate. So a plate's about this big, plotted against a, a measure of the volume of algae that's, that's available. And this is what you see. In the Caribbean, you get a decline, but the levels of uh, algae is much higher. Seaweeds have a real propensity to bloom in the Caribbean. Um, and we, there's a variety of reasons we think that might happen. In the Pacific, 
it's very different. In the Pacific, it doesn't take much seaweed at all, and you pretty much have no coral sediment. It's as if the corals in the Pacific are hypersensitive to seaweed, and as soon as they sense it, they choose not to settle it, and they go somewhere else. Now, it could be an evolutionary thing. These are reefs that historically have never really had much seaweed. Um, in the Caribbean, um, it's had a different evolutionary history. Um, there are large areas of, of, of vegetated habitats and, and so on. Anyway, um, and the last point I'll make in, in this sort of vein about you know, these ecosystems is that you know, one of the great things about being a biologist, I think um, many of us as scientists in general experience, is that we're often surprised by the system. And we do this work in Palau, which is widely considered to be a, about as pristine as you can get today. And yet sometimes things happen that really do surprise us. And so in 2012, some of these reefs were being struck by a cyclone. And where the cyclone struck in 2012, we had this, all the coral gets knocked over, as you would expect. And this is followed by a bloom of this red seaweed called Leogora. And this seaweed develops uh, very rapidly. This happens globally. Every time there's a major disturbance from a storm, the seaweed jumps up, and then it disappears again. And after the seaweed, I'll show you this in a second, after the seaweed went, Lobophora remained and became more and more common. And this has never been seen before in this environment. And this is the species of alga that the corals seem very sensitive to. So, if you look over time, so this is 2012 going through to 2015, this is the amount of this seaweed that's ephemeral. As soon as we have this storm, it pops up, and six months later, it's gone again. If we look at the amount of seaweed, we get this trend that it starts to grow whilst this Lobophora ligora canopy is present, but it just keeps on going. And the mystifying thing here was, even once the Leogora has gone, the Lobophora is staying, and it's getting worse. So this was a situation where most people in the field of coral reef science would argue, you do not find these seaweed on these reefs, not in high numbers. There is nothing to worry about. This is a Caribbean problem, but it isn't. Um, and so to try and understand this, we then have to start modeling some of the finer scale dynamics um, to get into this. So we do things like you know, long-term caging experiments to measure the algal dynamics. How do the seaweeds naturally grow? Um, we take a bunch of measures of when you have these seaweeds doing this, it impedes the ability of, of herbivorous fish to feed. You can imagine that you've got this thing doing this in the current, and of course the fish are trying to feed, but they can't get in right here because they're going to get bashed by seaweed. And we can measure this. And when we do this, if we plot time against the cover of this seaweed lobophora, and we're plotting it here for different trajectories of the amount of grazing by fish. Um, and we're just tracking all of the time series that really happened with this overstory algae. We find that there's a range of values that seem to fit our obs observations. And that's, those values are pretty credible for the types of fish that are there. They feed reasonably well, by no means the most fish you'll ever find. And the same applies at some other sites we studied. When we do this experiment, ignoring this sort of blip of the algae, which is an unusual event, we can't explain what happened. We can't get our models to fit. So the conclusion of this is that short-term severe reductions of the fish grazing, brought about by this sort of temporary bloom of algae, can have very long-term apparent effects. And so what we often consider to be an extremely resilient system can sometimes show surprises, what we hadn't anticipated. And again, the lesson for us here is, whilst we tend to think of these, these ecosystems on a, we measure things on annual rates. And we really should be focused on you know, a wider variety of possible uh, parameters when we're trying to model this. And then we would be less likely to be surprised. So we have to think about, so what happens if you get a real big spike in nutrients? Or what happens if you suddenly lose ha habitat? Those are questions that people haven't really looked at at the right scale. Anyway, let's leave coral reef uh, algal things for a, for a moment and come back to the bigger picture. What can you do locally? Well, one of the important things, as I mentioned, is you can try to keep these crown of thorns starfish under control. 
So here's somebody injecting a starfish with vinegar. But how do you do that? It's a really complicated problem. So you have a bunch of reefs, and you might have information on how many of these reefs are currently showing some kind of outbreak of starfish. And you can use information on the connectivity, the degree of, of, of if you release larvae of crown of thorn starfish, and we do this in a computer using an oceanographic model, we, we know that the crown of thorn starfish undergo this massive spawning in about November time. So we say, if this is the current distribution of our starfish, we release these imaginary particles, track where they're going, and figure out which reefs are going to be hit next. And when you do that, you might find that you know, some of these reefs are at very high risk of becoming um, uh, infected, if you like, with this outbreak. And equally, there'll be a bunch of other reefs downstream that will be affected by this in the next year. But of course, if you know something about this, you know that here the threat of this reef affecting reefs downstream is much greater than in this case. So you can use this kind of information to design strategies for where to intervene, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So this is something that we do. Every month, we send a spreadsheet to the people running the boats, and they decide where they're going to go. We give them suggestions on where to go and, and pick, because at the moment, they're working blind. This is a very low-tech thing. We're trying to make it much slicker with some computer system that they operate. But you know, it works fine with Excel sheets and, and email for now. Well, what do we do about coral bleaching? Coral bleaching is not something you can deal with locally, of course. And you know, people have been scratching their heads thinking for a solution to this, and there isn't one yet. There is no real way you can reduce this stress. There's a few cool ideas. People have tried creating oils that they can release onto the surface of the water that cut down the amount of light. And the oils will degrade in about a week. So in theory, that could work. But doing it at scale, not yet. So what else can you do? Um, one of the things we've been thinking about is, well, maybe you could be a bit more creative in where you undertake your, your protection measures. So one of the things that people do frequently is design marine reserves. And I'll talk more about that process tomorrow. But if you're going to design marine reserves, which can generate some of these benefits of having more fish, help the corals recover, blah, 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 where are you going to put them? And so when you look at any kind of ecosystem at scale, there's natural variability on the sort of summer conditions. If you look at Australia, for example, as you get closer to the equator, as you'd expect, the water's generally warmer. That means that the corals are used to experiencing higher levels of chronic stress. Some areas are not stressed very much in summer, others much more so. Equally, when you have one of these bleaching events, not everywhere warms at the same level. Some areas warm a little bit, and some areas get really hot where the water isn't mixing very well. And so you can define the extremes of these of these contributions. So there's four options. You can have either high chronic stress, low acute stress during bleaching, and all of those combinations. Now, if you were a coral, would anyone like to predict which of these four environments would be most conducive to a happy life? You've got a 25% chance of being right. C, we've got a C. A lot of those not even C. Yeah, yeah. C is a pretty good place to be. C, uh, A, is arguably the best because these are corals that are routinely exposed to stressful conditions in summer. So they're physiologically prepared. Um, and then when you get hit by a bleaching event, it's a relatively mild event. C is pretty good because, again, you've got corals that aren't being exposed to very high stress, but they're less prepared. And D is really bad news. Um, and so you can operationalize this, and, and in fact, you know, we've looked at this question a bit more in, in Australia. And one of the intriguing questions we, we looked at here is, when you have a warming event, what does it really look like? This is a graph. This is two weeks on the x-axis, a two-week period. These are the, the, the fluctuations in temperature. And this is this warming up for a bleaching event. All right. So you imagine that it gets warm. But it doesn't just happen linearly. You, know, you might expect, this is what you might mentally imagine would happen. It gets warmer and warmer and warmer and eventually it starts to cool. But this is what happens 70 to 80% of the time 
we get this pre-warming spike followed by the main event. And that pre-warming spike serves to acclimate corals to these conditions that are following. Um, and this is actually far worse because here you get the first big peak that's so rapid now that you get to level sort of much more than just or sort of precondition. This is very stressful. And if you do the physiology, so for example, if we look at the number of dead cells in the coral under these different scenarios, and this is our trajectory with this sort of pre-warming spike, we have far less dead tissue. The corals certainly do better when we do this. So this is, again, the same type of thing. And because we have 30 years of sea temperature information at a scale of about four kilometers, you can map where these areas are. These are where the A's are. This is the Bahamas. These are the C's, the B's, and the D's. So the simplest thing is you might say, well, let's factor this into our decision making. Maybe if we're going to put a reserve, we might cherry pick the A locations, um, and that would be a sensible thing to do. Or you might spread your risk across all four contrasting scenarios. But of course, we often have more information than that. We have this information on the strengths of the connections and the directions of the connections of the coral larvae, which means that you could have any of these sort of combinations, an A connect to another A, or an A connect to a C, and so forth. And of course, this is great for scientists because we love thinking about these complex problems. And we can entertain ourselves for hours thinking, how would you design an intervention strategy optimally? You know, what would you try to achieve? And as soon as you do that, you realize it's going to be even more difficult because you don't know how the corals are going to respond to climate change. There is various ideas, but there's no concrete conclusive proof on any of this. So what do you do? You start by taking one of your scenarios. You might say, okay, let's have a scenario that the corals are able to adapt or acclimate sufficiently. So what happens today is going to continue happening into the future. And so when you do that, you can come up with some kind of, of ranking system. I won't go into the details of this, but you can prioritize you know, which connections are you, you prefer and, and so on. And then you can run some optimization software and say, um, and I'll show that here. So here, I don't know if you can see that the areas with a black bold around them, those are areas that are picked as potential locations for a marine reserve network. And to do this, we've said, pick me 20% of all of those reefs. We've prioritized the different connections and said, pick me the design that maximizes those connections, the ones that we really value. And it's lots and lots of combinations, and this is a scenario. But of course, maybe corals won't adapt. Maybe they're going to fail. And in fact, the areas that are generally cooler today will in future be the best areas that are left. So you can do a variety of different scenarios of how you think climate change is going to play out. And then at the end of it, one of the things you can do is say, there are some of these locations that get picked irrespective of your scenario. So that at least tells you. Let's pick those. At least let's make sure we pick those, because they seem to be fairly important regardless of what happens. And then you can combine this with other information. That's all very well if you're focusing on things like marine reserves. But marine reserves are only going to protect a fairly small area of the coastline. You know, I think um, Australia is, uh, they love to boast about this. I'm not Australian, yes. You, well, I am now, actually. But I grew up in England, and I left when I was 39. And um, uh, you know, I don't think of myself as a proper Australian yet. Um, um, I, don't, I don't shorten my words frequently enough to be a proper Australian. And, um, and I don't wear thongs uh, or flip-flops, to clarify, uh, on my feet. Um, anyhow, um, so the problem with this is that you know, Australia boasts about the fact that 33.5% of the coral reef area is now in a no-take reserve. That's almost unprecedented. Most places, it's less than it's a few percent. But what about the rest of it? Because if we're talking about the sorts of scales of impact that happened in Australia, we lost 50% of the coral in a single event. Now, that leaves you with huge areas to rebuild in terms of coral populations. And reserves, in most places, aren't going to be able to do that. So it introduces a sort of concept of, which is a little fuzzy, of systemic resilience. How is the system going to function as a whole? Is there some system-wide mechanism to facilitate recovery of the whole system? 
And generally, when we ask these sorts of questions about recovery, we focus, as I have done earlier, on individual reefs. How do seaweeds and herbivorous fish affect the recovery of that reef? We don't tend to step back and look at the entire system and say, how does this whole system function? And so when we do that, we took an approach just recently that was really very simple. We just asked, let's apply three filters and see how the system is designed. The first was, we want to find areas of reef that are really potentially important at providing the larvae that will replenish the reefs that are damaged. Where are the areas of reef where they have ocean currents or coastal currents that can move past them, pick up those eggs, and deliver them to as many reefs as possible? So we model this. And when we do that, we identify these key sources of, of larvae. So we're looking for areas that have strong connections to other reefs. But we also want those connections to be fairly persistent. Um, we don't want them to be highly variable. We want them to be pretty reliable. And ideally, the reefs that they're connected to would themselves be connected to lots of other reefs. So that's something you can do using simple graph theory to figure out where those locations are. But it's all very well having a reef that's positioned to deliver all these eggs and larvae. But if the reef has just been knocked out by coral bleaching, there are no eggs and larvae because the coral population has declined. So then your second filter is, well, where are the areas that have a lower risk of bleaching? And for this, we applied an extremely uh, conservative criterion that was, are there any areas of the reef that have never experienced the level of warming that causes a mass coral mortality? And there aren't a lot of them. Uh, when we calculate that, that weeds it down considerably. And the third criterion is, you, know, you want your reef to be able to send coral larvae to all damaged reefs but you don't want them to be sending crown of thorn starfish larvae, because that defeats the object. So our third thing is, can you find reefs that are really good for corals, but not so good for crown of thorns? And that's a tall order, because they both spawn at the same time of year. The larvae are kind of similar, um, and, and there are. Um, and so when we do this, we end up with 112 reefs of, that's only 3% of the 3,800 reefs that make up the Great Barrier Reef. And the results are really patchy. You know, there's lots down here, there's a little in the middle, but there's big areas with, with, with nothing. Of course, as you relax these criteria, they start blinking back in again. But this was the first cut just to demonstrate what's feasible. But the really cool thing, perhaps, is that those 3% of reefs are so well connected that within a single Christmas spawning event, their larvae can reach 45% all of the reefs on the barrier reef, in theory. So they are in positions to have a huge impact. How is that possible? Well, it all has to do with the oceanography. That these locations on the outer reef, where you tend to have cooler ocean water coming in and entering the barrier reef system, and just to give you a sense of scale, um, this is about 100 miles wide here. So when this water comes in, it tends to be cooler on the outside. Not everywhere, but in many places it's cooler. And that's why the bleaching often doesn't get as bad right on the outside. Also, because the water is predominantly coming from sort of east to west, it's carrying larvae further inshore. So it helps to act as a sort of source to help make these reefs on the outside act as a source. But because the water's coming from sort of perpendicular to the reef, and most of the crown of thorn starfish, they start about here and move south, it's a different pathway to the crown of thorn star, which is why you can still find reefs that aren't immediately in, that, in, that, in the way of the crown of thorn starfish. So it is possible. So what does this mean? Well, you know, it's, it means there is some scope for reefs to help replenish the wider system. That there are, when we started this, we had no a priori reason to expect any reef to fulfill these criteria. We were just exploring what's possible. So we don't know if this is good or bad. You know, we are concerned with the scarce, scarcity of these reefs. Um, it does highlight, however, and perhaps this is the only valuable contribution of this, there's enormous variability in the functioning of these reefs. And we need to harness that in our management. We can't just ignore it and say this is all too hard and, and stochastic and, and, and unpredictable. 
Um, but there's real variation, and we have to think about how we can make use of this heterogeneity, some reefs being so much more important than others for recovery in our management. And so some practical things you might do is you might target some of your crown of thorn starfish surveillance at some of these locations. And even though they're predicted to have a lower risk of starfish, if not zero risk, and so, you know, the, the next step with a lot of that work is to come up with a much more uh, high, much more dynamic system that takes account of the current states of the reefs and asks, if this is the state of the system now, where might you intervene to maximize the benefits you get over the next few years? So it uses that heterogeneity, but it's much more dynamic. But, you know, when you give this kind of talk, and it's often a bit depressing and... Um, uh, you know, I talked about how nature can surprise us in a negative way when Palau with the emergence of this seaweed that we never expected to see on a reef like that. And of course, sometimes nature surprises us in a good way. And so in 1998, I mentioned there was this lack of bleaching in Tahiti. Well, the opposite was true in this atoll Rangiroa in the Tuamotos. And this is the second largest atoll in the Pacific it's connected to the ocean through two narrow channels, which means the water in the lagoon is not very well mixed. And the sea temperature in 1998 reached 36 degrees. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. It's about 97, something like that. It's, it's, it's unpleasant. It's unpleasant even to swim in. And so it literally sort of cooked things. And when we were there, the, these big corals... And these are of coral called parietes. And to give you a sense of scale, one individual coral can be from where I'm standing to the wall and about as high as this ceiling. And that can be a 1,000 years old. And a quarter of them died in three months. And I just couldn't get my head around that. When I say it died, if you went across, you swam across the surface of it, it would be covered in, you'd see no coral, it would be covered by small seaweeds that are beginning to grow on the dead skeleton. And all that was left were some sort of finger-like pieces of live tissue, you know, a little bit down here, a little bit over there, but it was more than 99% dead. And, you know, this was never been reported before. Usually, these corals are the most tolerant to stress. They go white like this. They almost always recover. They just lose, they lose their pigment, then they come back. But they died. And so... You know, this was unprecedented. In 2001, I wrote a paper, and at that time, the, the best estimates were it would take at least 100 years for these reefs to recover. So that's what we said. And um, I went back in 2013, and they completely recovered. I was so wrong. And you know, this is what it looked like in, in 1998, mostly dead. But there's little patches of live coral here, but mostly dead. And what had happened is it had resheated. We call this a phoenix effect. And those little patches of coral, they didn't have to create their own skeleton anymore. They could just shoot across the surface and seal it up again. And that's what they did. Now, it happens that this is a really quite a pristine location. There aren't any major sources of pollution. There's no fishing on these reefs. That may have contributed. I can't say. But remarkably, these corals came back. And now that finally you know, reconciles the, the problem I had from a population point of view of how can you have a population of a thousand year old corals with a mortality rate of 25% in a single year? That's how. They don't actually die, of course. And so, um, you know, you do see these things and it gives you at least some, some, some hope. Other things that people are talking about doing for reefs are trying to speed up the recovery process. I've talked a little about some of the natural processes you can do. So by managing the fish, you're facilitating the, the natural processes of coral recovery by keeping some of the competing seaweeds under control. But you can go further than that. Um, some of the work, the reason we're doing some work in the Maldives is because we want to understand the processes of, of, uh, of this rubble that gets established. So when these corals have died, you know, over the next year or two, they collapse, and you end up with these piles of rubble. And this rubble can take something like at least seven years to stabilize. Before it does that, it just rolls around. Wave energy is enough to roll it. So you imagine a coral larva settle on this, 
starts to grow, and then it rolls over, kills it. Nothing recovers. And you might wait seven years for that system to start stabilizing, and once it does, boom, the recovery can be incredibly quick. We saw that in Palau. But we know very little about the basic biology of this. We don't even know what processes are responsible to, to bind these coral rubble. And so how we work with engineers, we do really uh, simple things like work in their big wave flumes and put pieces of rubble in and figure out how much energy is needed to even move them. Um, so it, it seems like really, really basic research, and it is. But this is some of the secrets. And in fact, one of the, I'll just share a little anecdote. One of the really odd things that I've seen in working in Indonesia the last few years is, you know, in Indonesia especially, there's a problem with people using dynamite to fish. The reason they do this is often, it's not so much that they can't find fish, it's that people are moving to the coast because they've been displaced from farming. They're not good at fishing. They don't know how to do it. They're not very effective at it. Sure, there aren't a lot of fish, but they're really not very good. So they make these little bombs, um, and they toss them over the side, explosion. And when the, you look at the rubble that's generated from blast fishing, it takes at least 20 years for that to stabilize. In fact, there isn't a single example that someone can show me where it has stabilized. Um, and it must be something to do with the very small size of individual fragments that are generated when you blast something like that. And they just keep on rolling, and they never are still long enough to combine and enter into cement. So there's all sorts of problems that we have to sort of deal with and, um, um, and, and try and work with. So to conclude, you know, one of the things that's interesting about corals, but also a little depressing, is that they are at the coal face of climate change impacts. Um, you know, there's no question that the major part of the recipe in dealing with this is the aggressive action on dealing with greenhouse gas emissions. We know that if we can track something close to this scenario, which is the most optimistic, we can have better, much better futures for reefs. And the management that we do will be that much more impactful. Um, there really are a lot of efforts to reduce local stresses. Um, and you know, there's a huge role for science to direct that process and improve it. I mean, often there's a conversation with the people who manage these reefs, and they would argue quite rightly, we don't need more science to manage our reefs. If we could only implement half the things we know we would like to do at the scale we would like to do it, we'll be in a much better place. And so it you know, you then comes back to the scientists thinking, well, how valuable is our contribution? But there's a few examples I hope I've, I've shown you where that science can not necessarily change what they do, but certainly make those decisions more efficient and use those resources more effectively. So that's where I think we can really make, make our contribution. Um, you know, we, like others, look at the futures of reefs, but we are overly pessimistic, and we need to be very upfront about that. We're not always considering some of the surprises, the good surprises that nature has in store for us. Um, and, you know, there really is an important need to take a much more evolutionary-based approach to this. And that has been, with the exception of Marissa, who's done some work in that space, there really hasn't been a lot in that area. Um, I think I just switched off to, yes. Um, you know, this systemic resilience idea is a sort of emerging field, and you know, this isn't well defined, certainly by me at this stage. Um, but it's interesting. When I presented that work of these sort of 112 reefs, it gets a very mixed response in terms of the interpretation from the science community. Some people are very much glass half full, you know, like me. Oh, this is interesting. We didn't know that, they could, that there was this capacity for some reefs to be really well connected that might stimulate recovery. And others would say, yeah, but there's only 3% of the reefs. That's terrible. And they're right. There is only 3% of the reefs that fulfill these very strict criteria. But at this point, because no one studied this kind of thing in other reef systems, we don't know whether 3% is good or bad. It's just the what it is. And so until we do this kind of work in other environments, it's really hard to interpret this. If you want to interpret it as should it be considered good news or bad news, you need some comparison, which we're lacking. So I'll leave it up to you to decide whether you think it's good news or bad news. I don't really have a very strong opinion anymore. Um, and lastly, I'd just like to thank some people that have actually done lots of the work, of course. And so the, the ecological work on the experimental work in Palau is really being done by Chris Doropoulos and George Roth. Um, Bob Stenick, is, uh, works, we work with a lot on the 
herbivory manipulations. He's at the University of Maine. Susanna Enriquez and Roberto Iglesias, um, I work with a lot on the, on the coral biology. They look at the physiology of coral bleaching. Um, Carlo Hock is uh, doing lots of the connectivity work and the network theory. Um, and these are some colleagues who work on the sort of coral resilience stuff and predicting reef trajectories. Um, just reminded me, I just realized that this photograph was taken the night after our boat sunk in the Maldives. And uh, the reason we're smiling, and I'm smiling so much, is because we're still alive. <laughs> um, which was a good reason to have a photograph taken of the three of us. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, anyway, another story. Um, and Ken Anthony also works with us on some of those scenarios. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah, that's, that's a, yeah, so the question is, these reefs, these 3% of reefs that are found near the outer edge of the reef, who are good sources of larvae, how sort of dependent are they on other reefs to support them? Are they self-seeding? Can they maintain themselves sort of independently? Um, and the real answer is, um, if you look at the distribution of the level of self-seeding, they're actually in the, they're, they're below average. They're not very low, but they're sort of below average. We don't yet know if that means that they have a problem, if, if they are still dependent partly on, on the other reefs. Um, the limited input that they get from other reefs, how important is that? Um, uh, so that is a criteria, and that's, that's one of the problems with all of this kind of connectivity stuff, of course, is how much larval supply do you need to be important? And these are some fundamental assumptions that people make, including us, that are really hard to explore. But um, in general, they're in about the sort of 40th percentile of, of level of self-seeding, something like that. Yeah, Alan. So one potential stressor that you haven't mentioned that's gotten a lot of uh, notice or is, is ocean acidification. Yeah. yeah. So uh, ocean acidification is the sort of other big global stressor that many people are talking about with the increasing carbon dioxide absorbed by the ocean. And, and we, like a lot of people, have kind of left it in the too hard basket initially. There's, there's a number of problems with it. One is, um, for a long time, you know, people have done experiments where, you know, the traditional experiment you would do with ocean acidification is that you would ramp up the stress quite rapidly in the laboratory. And, of course, when you do that, in most cases, the animal or plant is unhappy quite quickly. And, um, but the level of stress that people often use to elicit a response is um, you know, probably about the, what we would experience in the year 2200. And people will use that kind of extreme value in order to get an outcome. And it's been very hard to figure out whether the sorts of levels that we can anticipate coming in the not too distant future um, are, what, when you implement those sorts of levels, you tend not to get a very strong signal in your experiments. Another problem is uh, how do you, uh, another problem has been the information based on what is the level of ocean acidification across this system. You know, for a long time it wasn't being measured routinely. That has changed dramatically and we now have um, biogeochemical models of the carbon chemistry across the reefs that are proving to have quite a high level of skill. So we're now in a position to start incorporating these effects. But we have another problem. And that is that when you start projecting into the future, you have this climate models are telling you how the ocean is changing on average. And you can get you know, some variation there, of course. But when you look at what happens in a system, almost any coastal system, it's hugely variable. You know, if you look at a coral reef over 24 hours, the level of pH fluctuates over several centuries worth of climate change in a few hours, just as you change the respiration and photosynthesis. The chemistry is incredibly dynamic. So with a system that's doing this, what is 
the relationship between a gradual, well, we imagine, and perhaps that's wrong to imagine it this way, a gradual change in the, in the ocean scale chemistry superimposed upon this highly dynamic system. We don't know that either. You know, is it gonna be a slight ramping up of the mean? Possibly. You get more and more frequent extremes? We don't know. Um, so this has been a really hard one. There was a nice paper in Nature where people did an experiment and estimated that, that the amount of climate change that's happened, or sorry, ocean acidification that's happened over the last few hundred years has reduced calcification by about 7%. So there are some evidence that are pretty good. Um, but it's one that we're really struggling to incorporate. But we, ha we have to, and now that it is possible to map that the dynamics at least, or at least to estimate the dynamics of that carbon chemistry, we can start to make progress. Yeah. How much do you do with the perspective of the that, uh, about local adaptation and dampening those potential risk effects? So the, the possibility that those out upward reefs aren't, so the corals there aren't so well adapted to the inward reefs. Yeah. Environments. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely I mean, a, good, a good question. And uh, you know, one of the things we've been thinking about is, you know, where are the hot spots of stress. Um, because another way of looking at this is you can find those areas that are most stressed, um, and what is the likelihood that you might actually get some, uh, some part of the distribution of corals, the genetic distribution of corals, so are the ones that are able to exist in these highly stressed areas. And if that area was large enough so that you have a large number of corals, all of, the only ones that survived there were the warm, adaptive ones, that they can actually start to reproduce with one another and that their larvae also find themselves in the same type of environment, so there's a benefit to that, and you start to sort of um, get some sort of genetic drift in the population. We don't really know enough about that, but so that would be a, a way of looking at it from that extreme. And in the past, we've sort of mooted the idea very generally, but we haven't been able to operationalize it. And that's partly why I think that we do need a much more evolutionary based approach to some of these questions. Um, you know, the scales, we can now get better at predicting um, at what scales are these populations structured? So um, what are the, um, and when we still have a lot of work to do on the alley effects, but um, you know, it's, it's tantalizingly close, but you know, this is the sort of stuff that will hopefully keep us employed for a while. Yeah. Can you, can you Yeah, absolutely. So the, the question about whether corals will migrate towards the poles, and we have this process uh, called tropicalization, and there's a number of places where this is happening. Um, Japan is a great example where people have seen this. Um, uh, another area just near Brisbane, in fact, where I'm from, is uh, we're now seeing that you know people initially began to see some coral reef fish show up. This is a temperate area, and you see these so there's lots of seaweeds, See, these fish would turn up, they would die in winter. Well, now they're overwintering. They're, they're able to sort of form, you know, persistent assemblages. More coral larvae are coming, and the system is changing. And um, it generates some fascinating questions about how that system is going to develop, you know. Um, so there's a lot of interest in that space. But sometimes this stuff happens, and it has really uh, unfortunate outcomes. Um, Working on coral reefs, for me, a healthy environment, when you get in the water, it's one that has no seaweed. Right? And it's just corals and, and, dead and bare substrate. I went to the Mediterranean a, a few years ago and was taken to what was apparently the hot spot of biodiversity in the Mediterranean. And we all got in the water. It was very clear, just like the Caribbean. And the reason it's a hot spot of biodiversity is it has so many species of seaweed. And my first reaction was, oh my God, this is terrible. But of course it wasn't, this is the Mediterranean. This was fabulous actually. You know, so we looked at this system, but amazingly, as you go towards the Eastern Mediterranean, there's been an, uh, an outbreak of, um, so rabbit fish that have come from the Red Sea, that have got through the Suez Canal, and they're so, uh, they're able to do so well now in those conditions in the Eastern Mediterranean, it's warm enough that this is a tropical group of fish that they're completely denuding the areas of seaweeds. And it's starting to look more like a coral reef with no coral. And um, so this is a real problem. And uh, so we're seeing you know, all sorts of weird things happening. Even in Florida, people have noticed corals creeping up the coastline, um, um, although they, it, it, it's some pretty significant sediment problems that will curtail how far they can move. 
So do you find that these populations of the least after the crown thorns have gone through is much more rapid? Yeah. Uh, because it's perhaps more local? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, something we've been discussing this week, actually, uh, as how do these different impacts have it? What's the difference in their impact? Um, and you know, a crown of thorn starfish outbreak will, of course, leave large areas dead. The first thing that happens is that they're very specific about the corals they prefer. They prefer the weedier species, the ones that grow very quickly. So they knock those out first. And if you can come and then control them, you're still left with a reef that's covered by these big mound corals that are very tolerant. So that's, that's one thing. If you cannot get to that reef and it keeps on going, they'll eventually kill everything. But the problem is, once they've done that, you're left with lots of dead coral skeletons. Now, the same thing happens after coral bleaching. The corals just die and remain standing. But then they just start to break apart. Unlike a cyclone, of course, that just knocks everything over. But at this point, there's very little information about whether a bleaching impact is that different from a severe starfish impact. Um, there's some reasons why it might be a bit different, but we're not really sure. Um, and, you know, and a particular concern with the starfish is that, that they can, if they start to run out of food, maybe move down deeper where you can't get to them and then wait till the corals recover and they come back up again. I mean, there's all sorts of... They're, they're not stupid, unfortunately. That's been a very interesting area of, of study. So if you go to, um, you know, deeper, so if you go to a sort of 100 feet down to 200 feet, you will find often quite prolific coral. Um, and the really remarkable thing is, when people have looked at this, if you have the same, you take one species of coral, and you go to this location, and you compare the genetics of a coral that's in shallow water with the same species that's sort of, 100 feet deeper, they're widely different. You now look at that coral, same species, 100 kilometers, but in a shallow environment, they're much more similar to each other. So although it's a very intriguing uh, idea that these deep water populations could act as a, as a reservoir, it's really open as to whether that's actually the case. Now, of course, um, you know, we just have to see. There's a lot more work to be done. But it is surprising, at least, that there, there seems to be a lot of, of, of depth-related structure, even within the same species. It's just mind-boggling.